All right, so in the previous video we talked about mRNA processing, and we talked about the first step that occurs in mRNA processing, and that is the addition of the 5 prime 7 methyl guanosine cap. We talked about how that was important for the 5 prime region stability. It's also important for recognition by the ribosome when we start translation, and it's also important for transport of the mRNA out of the nucleus. Another important processing that we're going to have of mRNA, and also some other types of RNA, is splicing. And it turns out that there's a lot of different types of splicing, and we're going to go over three types here, and there's a fourth type that occurs for transfer RNAs that we're going to cover in a different video. All right, so it turns out there are what we call self-splicing RNAs. A self-splicing RNA basically is a process of splicing that does not require a protein. Okay, the proteins that we're going to see are going to be involved in something called a spliceosome, and these are not going to involve that complex. So there's two groups of self-splicing RNAs. There's group one introns and group two introns. We're going to look at the group one here. The group one is going to be actually relatively simple. Okay, it's going to be a simple transesterification. Now what you have to re realize about this picture, up here I have this is apparently a uracil, and everything going this direction, that's an exon. Okay, that's the part that we want in the mRNA that's going to code for protein. Starting at this adenine and going this way, that's an intron. We want to get rid of that. Well, it turns out that's what we have called a free intron cofactor, and guanosine is the most active example. This is just a free guanosine. This isn't part of an RNA chain of any kind. This is just free guanosine floating around. And it turns out that the intron region over here is going to fold in such a way, remember that introns, just like all RNA parts, have a secondary structure. They're not just long linear chains. So they're going to fold in such a way that's going to make this phosphate exceptionally activated for attack by guanosine. So the three prime hydroxyl of this intron guanosine cofactor is going to attack the phosphate right here. You're going to get a phosphoryl substitution, and the exon, this whole region up here, is essentially going to leave as a leaving group. And now you have this intron cofactor that's now covalently bonded to the rest of this intron down here. So you see the net reaction. We basically substituted the exon for the intron cofactor guanosine. So now you have GA right here. That's basically what happens in the first type, and this is a summary of what happens beyond that right here. So we have this guanosine cofactor right here. The three prime hydroxyl group attacks uh, this part of the exon right here, that phosphate, and that's going to break off the intron right here. So this is the intron right here. It broke off. Well, now what's going to happen is we have a free exon. This green part over here is the exon. Well, now the free 3 prime OH of the exon is going to attack the 5 prime phosphate of the second exon in the series. So remember, we have this pattern of exon, intron, exon, intron, and so forth. So between these two green exons, we have this intron that was partially released. So now this free 3 prime OH of this exon is going to attack the 5 prime phosphate of this exon, and that's going to ultimately result in the release of this yellow intron. And we've successfully linked these two exons together. Okay. Now what you'll notice about this group one type of splicing, group one introns, is that when we release the intron, it's actually just a, uh, it's a linear chain. When we go to group two self-splicing introns right here, they're, they're gonna, we're going to get a product that's a little bit different looking, and it has a slightly different mechanism. So group one introns are going to require this guanosine intron cofactor. Whereas group two self-splicing introns do not require that uh, cofactor. These group two are going to fold in a different way. These RNAs are going to fold in a different way than group ones. And they're going to be such that on, on a specific adenine, adenosine right here, on this adenosine, remember how RNAs, they're, they're, the three prime OH is linked with five prime phosphate. Now, we never said anything about the 2 prime hydroxyl. The 2 prime hydroxyl of the ribose in all of these nucleotides, they're not covalently bound to anything. So it turns out that the 2 prime OH of this particular adenosine right here is free. Okay, it's not bound to anything, which leaves it able to react. So it turns out there's a branch point right here in the intron on this adenosine, and the 2 prime hydroxyl is going to attack the 5 prime phosphate of this uh, guanosine right here. And that's going to cause, first of all, the release of the exon over here to the left. Okay. 
Now, because we attacked, again, this 5' prime phosphate of the guanosine, uh, we now have a free uracil, or uridine, which has a free 3' prime hydroxyl group. And it turns out that that hydroxyl group can attack the 5' prime phosphate of this uridine, and that successfully joins the two exons together with the release of this strange-looking um, intron covalent uh, adduct. And notice what happened. When we had this 2 prime OH attack this essentially 5 prime phosphate of this guanosine, the 2 prime hydroxyl group happens somewhere in the middle of this intron. Um, it's just somewhere in the middle. It's not at either end. So because of that, we get this looped structure right here, this very strange loop structure, and this is termed a lariat. Okay? And so what happens is, is when we free the first exon and we get its, that exon's 3 prime hydroxyl attack on the 5 prime phosphate of the second exon, we get the release of this lariat right here. Whereas in group 1 self-splicing introns, because we used a free uh, guanosine intron cofactor, we didn't get the lariat, we just got this, this linear RNA intron chain. Here the intron chain is a lariat, so that's, what, that's why we get this, is because it doesn't come, the, the attack doesn't come from a free guanosine intron cofactor, it comes from a 2 prime OH within the intron. So if you just think about why we get this lariat, it's because we have the nucleophilic attack from within the intron. Okay? But the net result is going to be basically the same. We get two exons spliced together. Okay? So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. Now these right here are self-splicing RNAs, or self-splicing introns. Okay? They don't require any proteins. Okay? They really just depend on the secondary structure of the intron. Okay, here in group 1's, the self-splicing introns, their secondary structure favors attack by a free guanosine, or a GMP, or something like that. It can actually be a number of them. GMP, GDP, or GTP, or guanosine. It can happen with all of those. For the group 2 self-splicing introns, their secondary structure makes it favorable for this internal 2 prime OH of an adenosine to attack the intron's 5' prime phosphate. Okay? So it just depends on the secondary structure. They don't require proteins. In the next video, we're going to go over how the spliceosome is going to form, and then ultimately we'll talk about how it's, sim it's similar or different than these two self-splicing mechanisms. All right, so join us in the next video where we talk about the rest of uh, splicing using the spliceosome. Thank you for watching.